Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. The nature of moral theology, in his book, Richard Gula, Father Richard says that systematic theology is the discipline in which morality or moral theology finds itself. So moral theology is one thing that you could study if you go to the seminary or go to a Catholic university, you could study moral theology. Moral theology is part of a larger study called systematic theology. When I was studying for my first MA, it was going to be an MA in systematic theology, essentially the beliefs of the church. What do we believe as Christians and as Catholics? Within that study of what we believe, that systematic study of what we believe, is this study of moral theology, which is part of that larger study. Other, uh, other studies that we find as part of systematic theology would include Christology. Christology is the study of Christ. Mariology. Mariology is the study of Mary. Pneumatology, spelled with a P-N, almost like pneumonia. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Soteriology, the study of salvation. Um, ecclesiology, the study of the church, etc. So there are various disciplines that comprise systematic theology. Moral theology is one of those. I had a friend, a high school friend. He and I are the two priests in our class of 28 students. He went off, joined the Legionnaires of Christ, and was studying for his doctorate in moral theology at one time. This, essentially the content of this book, was going to be what he dedicated his life to, the study of moral theology, what's right and what's wrong. So systematic theology is the overarching discipline, and systematic theology <laughs> seeks to integrate the truths of our faith with other truths that we know. So any of these studies, Christology, Mariology, Pneumatology, Soteriology, Ecclesiology, etc., all of these have different truths how do we reconcile those truths with other truths that we've learned throughout our life? Uh, an example might be in physics. When we study physics, we learn about buoyancy force. Buoyancy force is how it is that if you want to be able to float, you have to spread out the mass of an object over the surface of the water. So we float. If you, if you lie on your back, you'll be able to float. Can you float on the heels of your feet? I say, can you walk on water? Ooh, that, that's physically impossible. So how do, you rec how do you reconcile those two truths? The one truth in Scripture, that Jesus walked on water, and the other truth of, of physics, that it's impossible to stand on water. Systematic theology looks at how to reconcile the various truths of our faith with the truths that we learn in other areas of our lives. It's a different degree of what we know, right? I mean, some people know certain things and some know others. Because it says other truth we know. Well, different culture, different different truth we know, right? Uh, is sure. that and, and ultimately it, together? It could be the case that, that the truth is different things for different people. Yeah. That is to say, Christopher is bold enough to suggest that this book says reason informed by faith. Deacon Cleophas and I don't see what Christopher is seeing. And I'm guessing that Deacon Angelic them may not either. We all see things from different perspectives. Does it mean that one person is right or one person is wrong? Not necessarily. They just have different perspectives on the truth. So we build our morals from that. But then the question is going to arise, so is there going to be any universal objective standard because ultimately, before the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, before the 1960s, we were thinking that some things are always right and some things are always wrong. Okay. That's one person's view of those, perhaps. Is that necessarily the way that everyone's going to look at those same issues? Moral theology focuses on the implications of our faith for the way that we live. So moral theology presumes that our, our faith our theology, our belief, is going to somehow influence the way that you live. Because you're a Christian, because you're a Catholic, that's going to somehow shape how it is that you, that you act. 
You're going to do certain things or not do certain things because of your faith. Moral philosophy is different. Moral philosophy then reflects on the moral life and what's right and wrong, but without reference to God. The essential question is, do we as Christian believers, as Christians, as Catholics, do we live our lives in a way that's different from non-believers? And if so, is that because of our faith, of our belief? The other question is, what are the implications of our faith for who we are and what we do? The, essential, the, the two questions that are essentially asked in that, in that line is, there's a difference between who we are as human beings, who we are, and what we do. And what we do makes us who we are, and who we are causes us to do what we do. You follow me? It was the chicken and the egg conundrum that we had back in our course on ethics. Are we good people? Are we good people because we do good things, or do we do good things because we are good people? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Right? Are we good people first, and so we do good things? Or do we do good things, and that makes us good people? But for us as believers, then, we realize how, how it is, then, that our faith influences who we are and what we do. Our faith influences both of these. Your, your faith, hopefully, influences who you are, and it influences what you do. The ethics of being, this is interesting because back before the Second Vatican Council, the focus was on doing what it is that you do, which is why we, we focused on those manuals filled with sins. What did you do? Why did you go to confession? To confess what you did. After the Second Vatican Council, where does the, where does the focus shift? Not from, from doing to being. What kind of person are you being when you're doing those things? What does your doing do to you and to your being? So the ethics of being simply suggested that we're not called to follow rules, which is a form of doing, right? The 613 rules of the Old Testament, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. It's all about following rules. Wait a minute, it's not about following rules. Instead, it's about imitating Christ being the love of Christ in this world. So in this ethics, the ethics of being, who we are matters. And so the question then is, what type of person should you be as a result of your belief in God and in Christ? As a result of your, of your belief, what type of person should you be? And so the focus is not on doing so much as on being. The analogy that comes from scripture as Jesus talks about the good tree bearing good fruit. He talks about that in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and other places throughout the Gospels. How it is that the good tree is going to produce good fruit. So we have to be good trees. And if you are a good tree, what are you going to produce? Good fruit. Meaning you'll do good deeds. So moral theology is not just about duties and obligations, not just about doing what we do, but it's also about who we are as human beings, and it's not just going through that sin manual and saying, you did this, so you're so that's a sin. Wait a minute. It's considering the circumstances. We go back to that oft-used analogy of Terry responding, answering the door to the person who knocks with a gun, right? What she did was she lied. Wait a minute. Moral theology, since the Second Vatican Council says, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't be so harsh in judging Terry, because even though what she did was a lie, Maybe there's something greater. Uh, we need to consider the circumstances. We need to consider who she is as a person, her end, her, what it is that she had in mind, her goal, etc. Moral theology, so this discipline that we know of as moral theology within systematic theology, is relatively new in the history of the church. It sprang up after the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was from 1545 to 1563. We know the Council of Trent because before the Second Vatican Council, the Council of Trent really was the last major council. Yes, there was Vatican I, and we remember Vatican I because that was the, that was the council that the Pope needed to convene because in 1854 he declared that Mary was conceived without sin that created division in the church. Now he needed to be able to bring the church back together. 
So what happened in 1870? First Vatican Council convened to be able to say that the Pope is infallible. That was 1870. But apart from Vatican I, really the, the, the first big council, the last big council before the, the Second Vatican Council, the First Vatican Council was the Council of Trent. So think of the implications. We went nearly 400 years as a church without a major council. So the Mass, do you remember the Mass before the 1960s? It was the Latin Mass. What did we call that Mass? We used to call that Mass the Tridentine Mass. Tridentine is the <coughs> adjective for anything that came out of Trent. Anything that came out of Trent was Tridentine. And so that Mass that you may have grown up celebrating as a child before the 1960s, the Tridentine Mass dates back to the 16th century. We didn't change the way that we celebrated Mass for 400 years. Which is why a lot of people got upset, because change is difficult. When you've been doing something for 400 years, you and your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents, and then suddenly they tell you, wait a minute, we're no longer to say, et spiritu tua, we're going to say, and also with you. Wait a minute. Latin just sounds so much holier, and you know, we have all of, all of those feelings that we had attached to the Latin Mass. We would sing it. We would sing it. We didn't understand a lot of it. But there's just something about that when we hear the Latin Mass that reminds us of, of, some, of certain memories in our lives. So anything that is Tridentine comes from the Council of Trent, and some of the things that came from the Council of Trent include our study of moral theology. Moral theology became a discipline after the Council of Trent. What was the context? Before the Council of Trent, we did not have seminaries. So the concept of the seminary is Tridentine. It comes from the Council of Trent. Do we all know what a seminary is? What is a seminary? That's a place where we form priests. If you want to be a priest, you go to the seminary. Before we had seminaries, in the, 1600, in the 1500s, where did priests go to school? They went to school in the universities. Ooh, that could be dangerous. So we send our, our, our priests' information to the universities, and they learn all sorts of things like philosophy, and suddenly we wonder if they are grounded in what it is that we as a church want them to, to know as they go out and minister. So the Council of Trent part of this Tridentine reform of the church, he invented the concept of the seminary to be, able to, to be able to teach priests all of these things that the church believed that priests needed to know in that era. If you're going to be a priest, you need to know moral theology, Christology, Mariology, Neutology, Soteriology, Ecclesiology, etc., etc. So how interesting that here at the Holy Family Theological Institute, it's not so much a seminary, these are the things you need to know, so much as a place where we can come and explore issues together, almost like a university setting. Seminaries tend to indoctrinate people, right? You have to believe a certain thing. And so, what did, what did we get out of the seminary? Priests who thought the same thing and were able to be good defenders of the faith. So that was part of the Council of Trent. Now that fundamental moral theology is going to be its own its own discipline, we came up with two types of moral theology. We refer to them as fundamental moral theology and special moral theology. Fundamental moral theology addresses sort of the big questions within moral theology, the fundamental questions of, of moral theology. The special moral theology addresses concrete moral issues. So it's simply taking all those principles and drawing them into concrete situations like sexuality, or medical practice, or business relations, social living, etc. The structure of moral theology. So Richard Gould is going to, to go back to this word that we've studied here in our last course. We had a course on ethics. He's going to begin with the difference between ethics and morals. What is the difference between ethics and morals? Ethics, he says, is the theoretical foundation of moral theology. So foundation is the meaning that ethics is the foundation, so moral theology is constructed on the foundation of ethics. 
Ethics is comprised of three things, which are going to be divisions in Father Richard Gould's book. The first, we study the nature of the good, meaning what is good. Second, we study the nature of the human person, who we are, and why we choose the things that we choose. And the third thing that we need to study as part of ethics is the, are the criteria of judgment, how it is we can say certain things are good or bad, right or wrong. Morals is different from ethics then, insofar as morals give direction to human behavior based on what we believe to be right or good. So in ethics, once we, once we judge something to be right or good, morals then is following that. To live a moral life means that you believe that something is good or bad, and you do that which is good, and you avoid that which is bad. That's living the moral life. Do what's good, avoid what's bad. Morality, then, we saw that ethics was comprised of three things, the nature of the good, the nature of the human person, and criteria of judgment. Morality, then, is comprised of four things, fundamental beliefs, what it is that you believe, the character of the moral agent, which simply means the person who is making the decision at that moment, looking at him or her, the use of norms, or uh, rules, guidelines for decision making, and situation analysis because in certain situations things will be right or wrong depending on that situation. Terry answering the door and saying, Father Jamie is not here, the man with the gun is looking to kill him. It's situational, meaning it would not be judged wrong in that context as lying might be judged wrong in other contexts. It's situational. So out of all of this, you're going to see we come up with new adjectives like situational ethics. What does situational ethics mean? It depends on the situation. Lying may be wrong in one situation. It may not be so wrong in another situation. It's situational. So morality is going to, to take that into consideration. Once we, know, once we judge what's right or wrong, morality then is how we live that up. Moral theology, then, is a twofold enterprise, according to, to Father Richard Gula. Now that we've talked about ethics and morality, and in his book he has a chart where he tries to show the interconnection of the two. He draws various arrows back and forth on page 11 of the book, showing that on one side we have ethics and the three parts that comprise ethics. On the other side we have morals and the four components of moral. It tries to show with lines, dotted lines and whole lines, how it is that the two of them relate. And he comes to the conclusion that moral theology then is a two-fold enterprise clarifying the foundations of the moral life, which is ethics, and interpreting how to judge and act in light of those convictions, which is morality. So ethics, knowing what's right or wrong, judging between what's right or wrong, good or bad. Morals, actually living it. So moral theology, he says, is not one or the other. It's not faith or reason. It's not ethics or morals. It's both and. It's both faith and reason, which is why he titles the book Reason Informed by Faith. Moral theology, he says, then, is Christian insofar as it draws from Christian sources of wisdom and is informed by the Christian experience. So moral theology, you know, Jewish persons could have their own moral theology, Jewish moral theology. Our brothers and sisters of the Muslim faith could have their own Muslim moral theology because they have a belief in God as well. So different faiths could have different moral theologies. What makes Christian moral theology Christian? The fact that we draw from Christian sources, like the Bible, the New Testament, and from Christian experience, our experience as Christians, which is, which is likely different from our experience of our brothers and sisters from other religions. 